in Peter this morning. Second Peter. That comes after First Peter. And First Peter comes after James. James comes after Hebrews. And if you can't find Hebrews, go to your New Testament, just kind of flip your way through. Find one of those one of those uh, books or letters. Hopefully we'll get there. Or you can cheat and go to the front of your Bible and look it up. Second Peter. Second Peter chapter one is where we're at this morning. And I believe that it is fitting. It's amazing how the Holy Spirit of God always leads in, in preaching and always makes it for the right time and makes it appropriate. At least I can I can see it and uh, understand it. It's amazing. We just ended with the Lord Jesus and John restoring Peter to ministry, restoring him. And uh, now we see that Peter, whom a number of years have passed, and who now God is just doing a marvelous work. He's, he's nearer the end of his actual life and ministry, and he's a mature man. And so I want to read this morning verses in chapter 1, if you found your place in 2 Peter. I want to read down to verse 3 this morning, and that's actually going to be our text. It's as far as we're going to go, but I also want to go over to chapter 3 and read the first two verses there as well, so we can kind of set our theme as we begin this study in 2 Peter. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us, through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you. What a nice thing to say. Through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Not only nice, but reality. According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Let's pray. Father, this morning, as we look at this Scripture, I pray that You would help us to understand it. And I pray that You would teach us important Bible truth from it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I quickly just turn the page in your Bible. It should be about one page to chapter 3. And I want to look at verse 1, where Peter gives a statement, the reason why he is writing this letter. An epistle isn't a letter. And so in verse 1 of 2 Peter chapter 3, he said, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both, which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us the apostles of the Lord and Savior. So here we find a purpose statement. As we begin to study a letter of the Scripture, we need to understand why it was written. You ever have somebody write you a letter? Maybe they said a bunch of things, and afterward you tell somebody, I got a letter from so-and-so. They say, well, what did they say? Uh, a lot of things. Well, the Holy Spirit, my friend, writes letters on purpose. Do you believe that this book, this book is the Bible, it's the Word of God? Do you believe that everything in it, God gave? Yeah. Say yeah like you mean it. Yes. He did. Knowing this verse, that no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God gave us this book on purpose. It's not only inspired, but it's promised to be preserved. It's a perfect book. It's the Word of God. And the fact that God gave it means it's important. Do you think in the whole scope of time and eternity that God perhaps could have written things other than what are in the Bible? Could He have told us things that either in addition to or instead of? The answer is certainly. Certainly. I mean, honestly, it's interesting. I'm reading a book right now that's about this thick. And I was thinking about it. It's taken me quite a while to read it. Usually I can't put a book down until I'm, I'm finished, but this one's <coughs> taking a little while. And I don't remember if it's like 1,500 pages or something like that, but I, I was noticing the other day that there are more pages in that book than there are in my Bible. And it, it's, it, it's a little convicting sometimes, although I think there's a good reason why I'm reading this book. It's a little convicting that sometimes we can read something more than we read the Word of God, or that sometimes we think reading the Word... When's the last time you read the Bible systematically through, like, not just like, well, I read my Bible every day, but I mean just sat down and read through the Bible like you read through a book that you're reading. And, uh, it's, and, and by the way, you ought to do that a few times. You should do that a few times. It'll help you to have a whole understanding of the whole counsel of God. This is the whole counsel of God. You'll have a whole understanding. 
God could have, could have given us things in addition, but God gave us His inspired Word. And this book is not just words. It isn't just things we can know about God. This is, these are things we must know about God. This is God's Word. Literally, this is all you need, my friend. This is everything. And when something like a small letter that the Holy Spirit used Peter to write... And by the way, Peter understood what it was to be an apostle, and he understood what it was to be used by the Holy Spirit to give Scripture. In, uh, in, in this same passage that we're in right now, Peter very clearly indicates what it means that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Peter knew that he was used by the Holy Ghost to write this Scripture. And so let me ask you a question. How important is it that the believers to whom Peter was an apostle, how important was it that they, that they received this letter? How important was it that the Holy Spirit was direct and clear about what was written? See, God's Word is not written to be confusing. It's not written just to throw out some facts. It's written on purpose, and a letter has a purpose. If you write someone a letter, you have an initial purpose at least in writing it, right? Your purpose could be, well, I haven't written that person in a long time. I need to write them. Okay, so what are you going to tell them? Well, tell them how I'm doing. Well, that could be. Or it could be uh, that you need to tell them something they need to know. And that is exactly what's happening here. God is using Peter as an apostle to tell the church some things that they need to know. Now you tell me what kind of a pet guy was Peter. Let's, let's start with intelligence. Let's start here. And I'm going to argue for him if, if you're mean to Peter. Was Peter a smart guy, a not so smart guy, or what do you think? Smart. smart. I'd say he's very intelligent. The Holy Spirit used him to write Second Peter, and if you study it grammatically, he's a good writer. Now, I know the Holy Spirit of God helped him, but my goodness, uh, you ever written anything like Second Peter? You ever written a letter that had that much doctrinal understanding articulated about God? So if you'd argue, well, Peter, you know, he didn't think, you know, he's an act first, think first kind of a person. Well, not this Peter. Not this Peter. This guy's an intelligent man. Uh, I believe his intelligence is tempered with life experience. Wouldn't you agree with that? You want to talk about a guy that really gets it. I mean, you'd say, well, Peter, you know, I just don't think you understand where I'm coming from. He's not the guy you'd tell that to, is he? I mean, just about anything wrong you've ever done, Peter could either relate to or have done it. Right? I mean, well, you know what? Uh, you don't understand. No, no, my friend, Peter was a guy that had a lot of life experience. Not only that, uh, but he's a seasoned, tempered man. Now you tell me, how many of us like to receive correction? How many of you like correction? Yeah? How many of you like when somebody comes and says, you are wrong, you're out of line, you're messed up. Now listen, when we grow and mature spiritually, we want to know, don't we? Did you have a question or you say you want to? Okay, you just, okay. You just like correction. Al loves it when I come. You're wrong, you're out of line, you're, <laughs> you're whatever. No, most of us, don't like correction, but Peter received it. It's amazing when you look at the relationship of Peter and Paul. And here, the time when Peter had kind of disseminated, separated himself with the Jews, with the Gentiles, and kind of treated the Gentiles like they were second-rate Christians. Mm -hmm. And Paul went to him and sharply rebuked him. And in this letter that we're reading, that we're going to study the next few weeks, you're going to see Paul spoken of as a great, dear saint in the Lord by Peter. And so Peter liked Paul who corrected him. A lot of times we don't like the person that corrects us, do we? But he, I'm going to just tell you, so this is a man of some remarkable maturity. He's a man who has been restored to Jesus. He's a man that understands grace. He's a man that understands mercy like no one else. And so in chapter 3 and verse 1, he gave us his purpose of why he wrote the letter. He said, I, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Peter mentions for his purpose statement that the reason he wrote it was so that the believers, the brethren in Christ, would be stirred up to remember, to mind, if you will, the Word of God, the Old Testament of the Scripture, and to mind the New Testament of the Scripture, the commands of the Apostles as well. 
So, if we were to summarize and say that we had a theme for the letter of Peter, that Peter wrote, the second letter, one of the things that Peter wrote the letter for was to encourage believers to remember to mind. Now, you say, Pastor, that's not very... You know, that's not a very good way of putting it. Well, I know. You know, nobody ever accused me of being super eloquent. I try deliberately not to be sometimes, I think. But the fact of the matter is is that what Peter wants to remind the believers to do is to stay fresh. To not forget. Have you ever been excited spiritually? Say yes. At least yes. pretend. Yes! <laughs> yeah. Do you remember the day you were born again? Yes. Rodney posted the picture of his baptism last year, this last week. And I think a lot of people think he just got baptized. But he got baptized a year ago. Uh, and what else happened the day you got baptized, Rodney? He got born again the same morning. The same morning. Now, was that an awesome day or what? Amen. Has there ever been a day like that in your life? Never in your life. The day I was born again, my friend, is the greatest day of my life. And it's your, your greatest day as well. It's the best day of your life. And I want to tell you something. When you, get, when you got saved... You realize that not, I mean, you always knew God was real because He made us knowing that. But I'm talking about God was real in the sense that He was really my God. And He was real in the sense that I really know Him. It's not like, you know, well, God, you're really real. It's like, I, I know you. And your Spirit lives in me and it's real. And it is positively thrilling. And when you get to know God in that way, I'll tell you what you want to do. You want to know what His Word says. You want to know more about Him. You want to grow in it. And Peter is writing to people that are called beloved. What's it mean to be beloved? It means you're one of the brethren. It's an, it's a, it's an us statement. My dear brethren. And they're, they're referred to that way as the beloved because they've received Jesus. They've received the Gospel that has been preached to them. And so when Peter references them as beloved, he's talking to people that are believers, but he said, I want to stir you up. Kind of an idea of, you know, get the, you know, get the, get the, the things mixed up again. Um, <laughs> I, I'm gifted at stirring people up. <laughs> it's a genetic trait. It's a Price family trait. Um, it, you, you know, my brother does the same thing, doesn't he? My dad does the same thing. We get people stirred up. My brother will come and he'll take Mike and he'll just wind him. Just wind him up. Get him wound up higher and higher and higher <laughs> until he gets yelled at by somebody. Just stir him up. Uh, when, I, when I go somewhere and interact with people, I, usually it's when I, when I go somewhere, people are kind of quiet, you know, nice and friendly. By the time I'm done, people are either partying or arguing. One or the other. They just, you know, you just stir things up. You know, just you know, interact with people. You know, you find out what this person likes and find out somebody that disagrees with them about it, you know, and stir them up a little bit, you know, and get them... Uh, <laughs> well, we're not talking about just getting people excited about something and getting people going when we talk about stir up. We're talking about getting you excited the way you were when you first learned the, the truth. When you first knew you were, you were born again, when you first knew you were saved. We were stirred up. Christian, let me remind you about something. It's something we want to work on ourselves, practically speaking, in the next several weeks. Something that we want to make sure we do is we want to stay stirred up. Now, we don't want to pretend to be excited. I know, I know, I know, I've heard before, you know, you get excited at a football game, you can get excited in church. Well, I'll be honest with you, I don't want you doing what you do at football games in church. Okay, <laughs> especially not if... <laughs> I've never been to a professional football game. Only, matter of fact, most of the football games I've been to is when I was in high school and I played football. I've never gone to a lot of football games. Let me just tell you something. Things that people do at football games are not things people should do in church. And not everything people do at football games is bad. Okay, it's just it's different. Worshiping Jesus has a, a reverence. It has a respect for God's holiness that uh, playing sports does. So I've heard, well, you get excited at football games, you get excited at church. Well, I understand, I understand the mindset behind it, but it's not the same. I've been to churches, and I... And this is not a criticism at all, but I've been to churches where people cheer like they're at a football game. That's fine. I guess if, if, that, if it's helpful and everybody's accustomed to it. If you did that here, if you started hollering and yelling like you do at a football game here, what would happen is everybody would turn around and stare at you and I would no longer be able to preach to you. Everybody would be like, well, what in the world? That's just, that's just the way it is. <laughs> okay, we got, the, we got the football row back there. Anyway, the point of it is this. 
you can get excited about something, you ought to be excited about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm not talking about talk. Listen, who cares about external? You ever met the person who could just be so excited and so calm about it at the same time? I played basketball in high school against a guy that looked like he was bored constantly. And he had the most beautiful jump shot. I mean, he could be in your face shooting a jumper <laughs> and drain the shot and leave and go down the court like, oh, that was terrible. I mean, he just was, he looked bored. He was fast as all get out, but the expression on his face was like, you know, just the whole time he played. Just I don't know if his face was dead or something, you know, it was just kind of like, but that's the way he played. But I'll tell you something, his actions belied his expression. I'm not here this in, this morning. I'm not interested in you having your eyes glued open, your mild, mouth big smiles. But friend, it'd be good if we were excited about spiritual things. And sometimes that excitement does transcribe into behavior. No question about that at all, at all this morning. But behavior doesn't make excitement. Excitement makes behavior. And I had far rather that you cared about spiritual things, things of the Lord, and your heart was stirred up to remember how great things God had done, what great things were in His Word, regardless of whether you know, you're jumping around and acting silly about it or not. Because the fact of the matter is being excited about the Word of God is going to, it will translate into actions, but we don't need the actions in the Sunday morning worship service. We need the actions to be lived out in our life when we serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what Peter is writing to the church here, he said, I want to stir you up to remember. And he's trying to stir them up so that they can act on the truth of the Word of God. My friend, the Bible is an action book. What happens when the Spirit of God begins to work in your life is it begins, first of all, to create change in us, but it also creates action in us. It causes us to go. It causes us to serve. It causes us to preach. It causes us uh, to stop doing things. It causes us to begin doing things that should or should not be in our lives. It causes obedience. It causes conviction. It causes us to say more, more Holy Spirit of God. Sometimes it seems as though uh, most believers have a stage of growth that they're satisfied to have reached. In other words, I just want to grow to this point. Whatever that point is, I want to grow to right here. And that's good enough. That's as far as I'm going. And I'm not going to take it any further. I maybe won't go away from there, but that's it. That's as far as I'm going. And Peter said, I want to stir you up. I want to stir you up. I want to get you to understand that when the Bible says that we're predestinated to be conformed to the image of His Son, speaking of Jesus, that we're talking about being exactly like Jesus. And as long as I'm not where Jesus is yet, I've got room to be stirred up. I've got room to be motivated to grow and to go forward in the faith. Christian, shame on us if we think that we've ever come to a place where we've arrived spiritually. Shame on us if we come to the place where we think, well, you know what? You know what? I'm, I, you know, I've, I'm serving the Lord more than everybody else in the church. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not doing the things other people in the church are. I'm probably a better Christian than everybody else here. And that's good enough. No, my friend, your goal is not people. You're not to be looking on others. You're to be looking at Jesus Christ. And friend, you won't ever get done with that. And by the way, if you keep looking at where Jesus is, you'll stay stirred up. You keep looking at where Jesus is, you'll stay excited. You'll, you'll stay, still see there are things to attain. Isn't it exciting to grow? Man, I'll tell you something. I, I am so thankful that the Lord called me to the ministry. I, I, I love the ministry. I'll tell you why. I, it, it, being a pastor is an exciting job. You'd be amazed in a week's time at the actions and interactions that I go through. Sometimes I feel a little smug about it. Like, I think people have no idea. Uh, we joke all the time. There's a couple guys that call me, and they'll say, what are you doing? They'll say, oh, you're not doing anything. It's not Sunday or Wednesday. You only work two days out of the week. Well, they don't take into the equation the fact that we have a church in Miami Beach as well, and, uh, but that we do maybe some things besides Sunday and Wednesday as a church. But it's, it's a joke. But one of the things that I do realize is that I get to do things that nobody else gets to do in our church just because the Lord called me to be pastor. I get to have, re I get to have interaction with people no one else gets to. I get to go places and do things. And, and, I, and I'll be honest, it's an exciting life. And sometimes I just think, man, I'm so glad I got called this because this is my kind of job. Is I, the ministry is what I'm called to. And it is, it's, my, it's, it's, it's my profession. It's my work. It's what I do. And uh, I'm glad for it because 
Some jobs are just boring. What's the truth? I, I like a job that you get out and do stuff and you do different things all the time. And the ministry is that way. But I, I, I admire so much factory workers, assembly line workers. You ever watch an assembly line worker where they take these two things and move them here? Take these two things and move them here. This, 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 this. And I mean, they can be, you go in and you try to do what they're doing and you find out, boy, they make it look really easy, but you try to do it and you can mess it up really badly. You know, but they're doing the same, but they do the same thing day after day and week after week. And I thank God for them because their jobs need to be done, but I sure wouldn't want to do it. I like a little bit of change up. I like a little, things to be a little bit different and a little bit exciting. I, I I'd have a hard time doing the same thing all the time. And you know something? Spiritually speaking, I'm afraid that sometimes we become like assembly line workers. You know, this is what you do. Hey, we, we all agree this morning that there are actions for individuals that are concerned with obeying Jesus Christ that are identical for everyone. Wouldn't we agree about that? In other words, what Christian ought to read his Bible? What Christian? Yeah, all Christians should, right? How often? Yeah, day and night at least, huh? At least, you know, day and night, I'd say. So in, at least in the morning, at least in the evening, at least something that works with that, maybe you, you're, you're only awake at night or you're only awake in the daytime, whatever it is, it ought to be that way for you. And that ought to be for everybody. Everybody ought to, be, ought to do that. How many Christians ought to pray? I mean, asking people for things. We all should, right? How many Christians should go to church? How many Christians should go soul winning on Monday night? <laughs> Y'all should. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is that if it's right for one, it's right for another, isn't it? There are certain things that are just right for all of us. But the reality of it is, Christian, is that you can do all of those things and they can just be actions that you perform. I've met people say, Pastor, you know what? I have not missed reading my Bible. I have not missed uh, going to the Lord in prayer. I've not missed church. I've not missed... But I just feel like I'm in a rut. I feel like I'm just doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. And Peter said, don't do that. Don't do that. Get stirred up. Get stirred up. Peter said, I'm writing things. So we're going to learn in the next couple of weeks the things that stir up believers. Isn't that great? Isn't that practical? I mean, you say, well, I'm supposed to get stirred up. Well, stirring it up, getting stirred up isn't something, well, you know what, let's get excited. Yeah! You know, start yelling until we feel it, you know. No, getting stirred up is something that's done deliberately. And Peter said, I've written these things so that deliberately you can be stirred up. Let's look at two things that Peter said he wanted to be stirred up. Chapter 1, Paul or Peter uh, introduces himself in verse 1. And he mentions something that's going to be a theme that's the basis for our being stirred up. In verse 1, he said in his address that he had written, he was writing to... Them that have obtained like precious faith with us. And he makes sure that we understand what the faith is. Boy, faith is quite a word nowadays, isn't it? People of faith. Faith, you know? Oh man, I'm really into faith, you know. You just gotta keep the faith. People use the word faith. When people use the word faith, I have no idea what they mean. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, I know what faith means to me, but I don't know what they mean, you know. Well, you know, we 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 both have our faith. Think, oh, both have our faith means what I've got and what you've got ain't the same, but we're calling it the same word. I mean, it's whatever it is you've got. And Peter is specific about what the like precious faith is. He said the like precious faith, he said, is something that we have obtained. Now, the idea of obtained is received, and we know from studying the Scripture that we receive it as a gift. But a gift is something that we receive. He said received, and it's been obtained. Uh, we've obtained it like precious faith, and he said the means for receiving this faith or obtaining it is through the righteousness of God our Savior and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And he gives the Gospel in those two, two, word, two phrases. The righteousness of God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. This is so simple, so profound. My friend, when you come to understand the righteousness of God, one of the things you realize is I don't have anything. When you understand what the righteousness of God means, it means the absolute absence of anything that is sin, anything that is evil, the absolute presence of all that is holy, and the intolerance for sin or evil. 
When you come to a place of understanding of the righteousness of God, one of the things you understand about God's righteousness, there's a positive aspect. It's He's so good and He's so intolerant of me. When you realize what it means that God is righteous, you realize God won't tolerate me. Sometimes, sometimes we think that good is tolerance, but actually good is intolerance. Good is intolerance of evil. And the righteousness of God is positive, absolute intolerance. And so you see two important truths in juxtaposition or opposition to each other. The righteousness of God, and then it says the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, the righteousness of God and then uh, our Savior Jesus Christ. It didn't say faith of Jesus Christ. It says Savior Jesus Christ. The fact that Jesus Christ is Savior, and it's a capital S Savior, it's His title, is indicative of the fact that we need saving. The fact that Jesus is a Savior is indicative of the fact that we need saving. How often do we meet individuals when we begin to question them about the Gospel or about whether they've received the Gospel, and they'll indicate to you some reason why they're good enough that God should accept their person. My friend, the righteousness of God is an indication that you are not good and that God will not accept your person. But Jesus Christ is the one who saves us from the wrath of God, the Father, and His righteousness. Listen, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We know this, don't we? We're not the exception to sin. My friend, if you're a sinner and you think God looks lightly on sin as though it were no, no great matter, you have a misunderstanding of the righteousness of God. And that's why we need our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Peter just said, we have precious faith, and we've obtained the faith through the fact that God is righteous and Jesus is our Savior. By the way, if you're here this morning, and some of that kind of makes sense, but you don't really know it personally, you never know, you don't know the time when Jesus Christ became your Savior. Can I say to you, God wants you to? This is not something that is for a few special elite. There are no elite individuals who have gotten something for free. And that is God's righteousness through Jesus. You're here this morning and you don't know for sure that you're born again. Uh, God wants you to know that you're born again, my friend. He wants you to receive Jesus. And, and all you have to do in order to receive Jesus is to understand a couple of things. First of all, Jesus is God. In spite of the fact that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and that the wages of sin is death, in spite of the fact that we receive, we, we deserve God's righteous judgment, Jesus died in our place. We all know the story, I think, of the cross, don't we? That Jesus died on the cross. We also know that Jesus died for sin. But one of the things that oftentimes does not seem to be connected in the minds of individuals is the fact that Jesus died for my sin. In other words, when He died on the cross, He'd never sinned. So when He died for sin, He didn't die for mine. And He didn't just generally die for sin that's just out there. He died for specific sin that's been committed by individual people, namely us. When we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly, that is us. We are the ungodly. Jesus died for our sin. And my friend, you're here this morning. Can I say to you, Jesus died for your sin. God loves you very much. And Jesus died for you, for your sake. And so you can obtain like precious faith by doing what the Bible says you must do. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm telling you, friend, you can say it's too simple, but if you study it in the Bible, one of the things you'll discover is that being born again is as simple as saying, God, I'm a sinner. I know Jesus died on the cross for my sin, and I'm asking you to save me because of what Jesus did. I want the gift. The Bible calls eternal life a gift. I want it. I want it. And, and when you say, God, I want it, the Bible says, God will give it, and you'll obtain it. And you'll be listed, you'll be mentioned, you just write your name in here, to them that have obtained like precious faith, it could be just to your name that have obtained like precious faith through Jesus Christ. Now Peter uh, makes a statement, and by the way, this is God's plan for every Christian. Grace and peace be multiplied. Grace and peace be multiplied. Now let me just say a couple things about this. This, is, this isn't part of the message this morning. I'm almost done with the message, believe it or not. Grace and peace be multiplied. We know what grace is, right? We've defined it a lot of uh, different ways. People made an acrostic out of it. God's riches at Christ's expense. Um, we've called it unmerited, undeserved favor where God does something for you you don't deserve. If you could just understand that grace is just God's goodness to you. God's doing something that's really good to you. And goodness really is in contrast to uh, whether or not we deserve it. So if you could just say, I don't deserve it, but God's been good to me. 
And you call that grace. But it's interesting that these individuals are already saved. How are, how are we saved? By, 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 by grace through faith, right? They're both... I'm not going to... I don't want to get into it. A lot of people get wacky about Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. But we're saved by grace, my friend. We're saved by grace and we obtain grace through faith. Well, if we're saved by grace, then we have it, right? Well, we have saving grace, but my friend, Peter indicates to the believers, he says, it's my desire that grace will be multiplied to you. Now, this is a marvelous, nice thing to hear. Matter of fact, if I were to write it, and I were to write it to myself the way I'd like to receive it, I would probably take out the grace. Not because I don't need grace, because, but because I understand why I'd need grace, and I just put the peace be multiplied unto you part there. Because if you need God's grace, it means that there will be times in your life when there's not peace. It'll mean, it'll mean times that literally you're going to go through things that you don't have the power or the ability to, to go through. And, and I, I, I'm being a little bit silly about not wanting it. My, my friend, one of the most marvelous things that can happen in your life is for you to go through something that you cannot by your own strength endure and have God's grace to do it. But Paul is indicating here not a life of health and wealth and prosperity. He's indicating here a life of hardship which is absolutely marvelous because of God's grace. A Christian, practically speaking, you and I need to learn to live the life that we have, not the life we think God should have given us. How often I hear people say, why is God doing this to me? Why is this happening in my life? My friend, so that you can have grace. And it's worth it. You need to learn to live the grace walk, the grace way of Christian living, where you say, God, I'll go through anything as long as you give me the grace to do it. And you know what will happen if you learn to do that? You'll have God's peace and it will be multiplied to you. So Peter just basically said, God help you. My prayer for you is that God helps you to get through everything with grace and peace. There's no prayer to not have hard times. No prayer to not have to suffer. Just, just a prayer that you'd have grace and peace. When I think of this, I think of that time when Peter was in prison. Remember when, when uh, Herod was really had pleased the Jews in the early church and he took James and killed him with the sword and it made the Jews really happy? And so Herod, Herod caught Peter, put him in prison. And he was going to behead him. You know Peter's, the, Jesus' last word to Peter was that he was going to die for Jesus. Do you think when Peter was in prison he had any inkling that he would ever get out? I mean, Herod's intent, his state of purpose was, I'm going to kill him and I'll make the Jews happy. And Peter's in jail. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, the, the saints are praying and an angel comes and lets Peter out of prison, takes him to the door of these people. They don't even believe it's Peter. They get, and the, he, has to, he had to knock again a second time. They let him in. And they prayed to God afterward. That prayer is absolutely fascinating. If I had been in prison thinking I was going to die and I were to pray afterward, you know what they prayed? They said, God grant us that with all boldness we would preach the gospel. They didn't say, God help us, help Herod to leave us alone. They said, God help us not to be afraid to preach in spite of the fact that we'll probably get killed for it. That's quite a prayer, isn't it? In other words, the believers didn't say, God help us to have a peaceful life. I know that we're supposed to pray that we can live quietly and peacefully, but that Peter's concern after being in danger for his life, being delivered by God, was not, God help this never to happen again. Peter's prayer was, God help me not to be silenced. Help me not to be afraid. Help me to be bold whether it happens or not. Help me to preach the gospel anyway. And that's the same guy here saying grace and peace be multiplied on you. You get a little bit of an overview, a little picture of the kind of a guy that's writing this and wishing it on these people. He's not saying, you know what, peace, no problems. No, he's saying, may you have God's grace and may you have God's peace no matter what. Because you certainly will have problems. Christian, one of the most helpful things I can ever say to you is that life's going to be tough. If it isn't tough now, it's going to be tough at some point. Some point in time. Don't ever look at somebody and say, oh, their life is so easy. Well, my friend, it may be easy in this season, but every person is going to endure hardship. They're going to go through things. They're going to have to endure, and they're going to need God's grace. And Peter's prayer is, God's grace be with you. Now, the final thing that he said, that, that wasn't one of the things that I was going to mention to you this morning, but he points out the 
way that God's grace is. He says, according as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. That's a long statement. But, oh, is it ever a good one. I use this statement a lot of times when I talk about Christians growing. According as His divine. What does the word divine indicate? Human or... or, or uh, is, it, is divine a word that we use in description of humans? No. No, what does it describe? God. Deity, right? Deity, God. Okay, so we're not talking about human ability, human power. He said, according as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Now, Christian, let me stop here and make one statement that this passage of Scripture supports, and that's this. You can make it. You can make it. And that may not seem terribly profound, but there's days when you need to know that. You can make it. You know, when you look around in a room of smiling faces like you see here today, you see a bunch of pretty happy people. But I'll just tell you something. You don't always know what's going on at home. You don't always know what people can't tell you. Sometimes things are happening. Sometimes I know things that are going on in people's lives, and I just think nobody else in this room knows what this person is going through, but they're going through something. But let me just say to you, if you're the one going through it, you can make it. You can make it because the Bible says, according as His divine power, I'm sorry, has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Do you know you have everything you need to get through life and to be godly? Pastor, you know what? I'm struggling with sin, and I don't know if I can have victory over sin. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And God's given you what you need. Pastor, I don't know if I can... I don't know if I can be stirred up the way that I'm supposed to be. I'm just going through so many things. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And God has given you everything that you need. And we're going to just finish this verse and, and we'll, we're going to look at those things the next, through next several weeks. But we're going to see here in the last part of verse 3 that it says, Through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. My friend, if you're going to make it, you're going to say, like Paul did, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Peter said, you have all things that pertain to life and godliness. You're partakers of the divine nature. And he goes on to say about this matter, he said, through the means that you have this is through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. You're going to make it, but if you make it. You can make it, but if you make it. You'll make it through the knowledge of God. Through the knowledge of God. Pastor, I'm dealing with an addiction. There is something in my life, and, and you know, some people might not even think it's a big deal, but the thing that really gets me about it is I can't stop. I cannot control myself. I've done the same thing. I've said I'm never going to do it again. I've promised God I've done things, and I'm telling you, I keep doing it, and I don't know if I can ever quit. I'm dealing with an addiction. My friend, if you make it, it'll be through the knowledge of God. Pastor, I'm struggling with some things. It's thoughts. Honestly, I just... My thoughts, if you knew the thoughts that I thought, you'd wonder if I was even saved. If you knew the thoughts that I thought, you'd think, you'd think things about me. Pastor, I'm just telling you, you know, I know, I know that my thoughts aren't right, but I don't know what to do about it. My friend, you can make it. You can have the thoughts you ought to have, but you'll do it through the knowledge of God. In the next couple of weeks, we're going to see what God wants from us in order to, in order to know Him. And that's going to be the theme of 2 Peter. And I want to conclude by asking this. Are you committed to truth? Are you willing to be stirred up? Are you committed to truth? Are you willing to be stirred up? The truth of the matter is, is that if you see the character of God, my friend, you'll have no argument. You'll have no excuse not to be everything God wants you to be. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that be great to be what God wants you to be? I'm telling you, if, if, if you'll commit to it, you can you can make it. And friend, you don't have to let spiritual things get old. You don't have to grow cold. If there's a coldness, it might be you you absorb coldness from Christians that are around you. You say, well, pastor, everybody's cold. Well, you don't have to be. You don't have to be. Friend, you could be in a place where everybody is so far away from the Lord. If you compare yourself to people, you'll excuse yourself. But you know what else you can do? You can be stirred up in your pure minds by way of remembrance. And it can be just as fresh for you as the day that you were born again. You can have the knowledge of God. You can be 
executing God's plan in your life and it can be as wonderful to you as it was the day you were born again. My question is, do you know that's what God wants? There's no doubt about that, is there? Then are you willing to commit it to the Lord? Let's pray and we'll have our invitation. Father, this morning, Lord, I pray that you've excited us just a little bit. God, more than just a little bit, I pray that in our hearts, we'd have a desire to be stirred up. God, my prayer for this church is that you would stir us up. And God, I'm not just asking that for other people. I want to be stirred. God, I want us all to be excited about spiritual matters, spiritual things. Lord, I want us to be thrilled about Bible truth. And God, I want us to be growing in the way we were when we were born again. Lord, help us to remember what it was like when we got saved. Father, I pray for every person that's here this morning that you would help us to remember our divine faith, the promises that we've received through Jesus Christ. And Lord, help us to be committed to growing in the knowledge of you, who you are. And as we learn in the next couple of weeks how to be stirred up and how that we can be so that we're not barren or unfruitful, we're always abounding. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be committed to that life. That's what you want, Lord. We need to be obedient to it. Father, if there be a person here today that's not born again, they do not know that they have eternal life, I pray that today would be their day of salvation. Bless and move in the invitation that we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't believe we have our pianist out of the nursery yet, but we're going to begin our invitation anyhow. If you'll open your, body, your hymn books uh, this morning, you'll open up to page 247. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. Before we sing, let me just explain the invitation in our church. Uh, many of us are accustomed to invitations or not having invitations, depending on how it is, but I want to make sure everyone understands what it's for in our church this morning. We're going to sing Jesus is Tenderly Calling Thee Home. And uh, when we sing, when we sing, and what we're talking about in the song is coming back to the Lord Jesus. But it might be that you're here this morning and there's no returning to the Lord Jesus. You'd say, you know, I've never really met Jesus. I don't know God personally. I've, I've been religious. I've gone to church. I'm even here today. But I've never, you know, when you talk about being born again in Sunday school and such, I've never done that. I've never been born again. I don't know that I have eternal life. My friend, the invitation this morning for you is to get that matter settled. You say, well, I don't know enough about it. I'm not educated enough. I could. We can help you. During the invitation this morning, I have Brother Tosh standing in the back, over in the back corner. And when we begin singing this morning, if we're physically able, we're going to stand in just a minute. When we stand up, man, you could just go right back to Brother Tosh. If you're a lady, he'll have a lady take a Bible and open it and show you how you can know for sure that you have eternal life. If you're a gentleman you're here this morning, Brother Tosh would be happy to, to share with you. And if you're here with someone, they brought you to church this morning, take them with you. Say, you know what, I need to go talk and make sure that I'm born again. If you think that someone here would think, oh wow, I didn't know they weren't saved, or think something about you, if you got up and moved in the invitation, my friend, you misunderstand everybody here. First of all, every one of us needed to be saved. All of us need to be born again. If you're not saved yet this morning, that's just what you need. All of us need something spiritually here this morning. But that's your need. So don't think what people think about you. You'll be just like the rest of us. All of us are spiritually needy. So no one will think anything. We'll just rejoice with you in, uh, in, in uh, coming to the Lord Jesus if you're not born again this morning. My friend, do not be ashamed to admit that you don't know you're on your way to heaven. You'll go to hell for that kind of shame. You think that's of God? No, no, no. That is, God had, that, there's an enemy of God and He's an enemy of you and He'd like you to be embarrassed to go to heaven. And that's nonsense. Don't, don't allow your shame to keep you from responding in the invitation this morning. You're here this morning and the Holy Spirit of God said, you know what, you've been, you've been a little stagnant. You've been a little stale. You need to be stirred up. And you need to be stirred up and you need to be committed for a couple of things. I'm going to ask you if the Holy Spirit of God would speak to you about committing to being in the service the next several weeks. Maybe the Spirit of God said, you know what, you need to be here when we, when we go through this teaching of the Word of God. You need to be committed to be there. If, if that's true and God spoke to you about that, you know about it, don't you? The Holy Spirit said it, and uh, you heard it, and so you respond in the invitation. You could respond just by kneeling right where you're at, maybe remaining seated while we're singing the hymn of invitation this morning. But whatever it is that God's done, maybe you need to pray with someone, maybe you need some help. Brother Taj is there for that, I'm here for that. But we're going to begin the invitation. If you'll open your hymn books to page 247, if you're physically able to do so, we'd ask that you'd stand so it make 
make it easier for people to move around you if the Spirit leads that. And we'd ask this morning that you respond as God's Spirit has spoken to you. Page 247, Jesus is calling me home. As we sing it, my friend, if you, if you need to do business with God, instead of singing, you do, uh, you do business with Him that time. Jesus is tenderly calling me home, calling today, calling today. Why from the sunshine of love wilt thou roam farther and farther away? are praying and if God's spoken to you, if He's called you, my friend, He wants a response. Don't be embarrassed. Don't think about what people think. You do business with the Lord as we sing verse 2. Jesus is calling the weary to rest, calling today, calling today. Bring Him thy burden and thou shalt be blessed. He will not turn thee away. Jesus is pleading, no less to his voice. Hear him today, hear him today. They who believe on his name shall rejoice. Sing the uprise and away. services to express gratitude to you for being here today. Friend, I don't know if you understand the important part of being part of the where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them, but your being here this morning and you're having the Spirit of God living in you has added to this service. It's helped your being here this morning. Sometimes we think, well, it's not important if I'm in, in church. I, it's not important. I don't help or I don't influence anything. You'd be amazed at how much your being here is an influence on those that are around you. It's, it's incredible, and it means the world to us. It means the world to me. I'm grateful that you've come this morning. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to open the Word of God and preach it to you. Thank you for the way that you've received it here this morning. Thank you for being in this place. Thank you for allowing me to be your pastor. I do count it a privilege, and I count each of you dear friends. If I can be a help to you in any way, I certainly would like to do so. I'll be around here for a little while. I usually say I'm here all day, but we'll be in Miami Beach this afternoon because we've moved our service to the afternoon, but I'm available after the service, and my wife and I are available for you at any time. Make sure to call us. Our number's in the church bulletin. If you need anything, if you, uh, if there's anything that you need Bible help on, we don't know everything, but you know, life's pretty simple when you have the Word of God. It does have the answer for everything, and we can help you find that. So if we can be of assistance to you today, we'd like you to do so. We never conclude the invitation, but we do close our service. You're here this morning, God's spoken to you, but you haven't yet responded. The invitation isn't over. This isn't the end, uh, my friend. God's still calling you. He's still inviting you. And as we conclude this morning uh, in, in a word of prayer, I just see someone. See Brother Tosh, see myself, see my wife, and we'd be happy to open a Bible and take the time that you need in order to help you with spiritual truth. Let's pray and dismiss our service now. Father, we're so thankful for Jesus Christ. We're so thankful for this local church and for you calling us to be in this place this morning. Thank you for what you've done here today, and we ask that you would bless each individual this afternoon. Lord, I pray that you would refresh us spiritually and help us to be able to serve you throughout this week as a result of the things that we've seen and done here today. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.